All right. Hi, everybody. This is Gatsa. Today, I've got arguably the biggest academic that I've had on my show. And that's saying quite a lot because I've had some truly accomplished people. Today, I have with me Professor Judea Pearl. First, let me say hello to you. How are you doing, Judea? Oh, I'm great. Thank you. It's, it's a beautiful Friday. It's Well, what day is not beautiful when you live in Southern California? This is where you are directly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, right. So I love when I meet somebody in California and they say some something as banal as, my God, we're having such beautiful weather today. And I say the weather hasn't changed since the Pleistocene era, <laughs> 1.2 million years ago. What a banal statement. But yes, it's great to meet you. Uh, for those, let me just take a moment. Well, the, the whole point of a causal reasoning, you know, <laughs> is to treat the banal, the banal happenings as if, you are grateful for someone. <laughs> so true. Uh, for those of you who don't understand that particular quip, it's because uh, Professor Pearl is a world-renowned expert on uh, causality and how you would model it and say AI, artificial intelligence. We'll get to all that. Let me introduce uh, who you are. You're a professor of computer science and statistics and the director of the Cognitive Systems Laboratory at UCLA. Uh, as I mentioned to you privately, one of the best ways for men to have a reduction of their testosterone is to go and watch your Google Scholar Citation Index. It is simply beyond belief, 120,000 plus uh, citations. This basically means that his Professor Pearl's work has been cited 120,000 times. His H index is 112, again, a number that is difficult to believe. He's a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence, Bayesian networks and causality. He's the recipient of the Association for Computing Machinery's Turing Award, which is akin to a Nobel Prize. Alan Turing is a unbelievable computer scientist from the 1940s. Honorary doctorates from Hebrew University, Yale, Carnegie Mellon, Texas A&M, Chapman, and University of Toronto. And I'll just end with a, a partial list of his books. Uh, heuristics, intelligent search strategies for computer problem solving, causality, models, reasoning, and inference, a, a book of a different vibe, I Am Jewish, personal reflections inspired by the last words of Daniel Pearl, an edited book, which we'll talk about later. And his most recent book came out a few years ago, The Book of Why, The New Science of Cause and Effect. Did I miss anything that I should have included in that introduction, Professor Pearl? No, it's more than I expected. <laughs> okay, so I thought what we would start is, uh, let me give you a bit of my own uh, personal connection to your work. Uh, I can't claim to be a, you know, a, an, an astute student of your work, but I first was exposed to some of your work because I was, my undergrad is in computer science and mathematics, and I was very interested when I headed off to do my PhD to maybe study artificial neural networks as part of you know consumer and economic decision making. And so I got a chance to first learn about your work through your belief networks and so on. Uh, I also had a, a wow. doctoral committee member by the name of Alberto Segre, who is a computer scientist. And I had to, uh, is the name ringing a bell? Yeah. Alberto it's, just, it's ringing, it's still, keep on talking while it's ringing. <laughs> Uh, and I had written a paper on how to model uncertainty. Uh, and I remember, although I'm not sure that I would pass the test if you put me through it right now, although I tend to remember all the material that I've learned in my past, dempster Schaefer theory, I remember that quite well. And so, you know, there are many, many places where I think our words, our worlds could have uh, connected. Now, my doctoral dissertation, and then I will cede the floor to you in a second, my doctoral dissertation was in the area of information search, but specifically, when is it that we know that we have acquired enough information to stop additional search and commit to a choice? So when I'm choosing between Clinton or Trump, or I'm buying this car or that car, or this woman I'm going to marry or that woman, I don't sample all of the available information, contrary to classical economic theory. Instead, I sample enough information to say, I stop and I'm ready to choose. So our worlds intersect. I'm done with my intro. Take it away, Judea. What, what... Uh, you want me to connect to the problem of search? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, do you do you do you, in your own work? I mean, you're you're a computer yeah. scientist, so you 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 model stuff, whereas I'm an experimentalist, a behavioral scientist. 
how do our word worlds where I apply information certainty yeah. theory to you, how might they connect? We have a very similar um, setup in um, AI in the area of game playing. Okay? When you play chess or checker, right, you have an evaluation uh, function over the strength of the board. But you are not satisfied with your immediate evaluation of the strength. You search ahead. The question is, how far do you need to search? And no, what do you do when you search? You go ahead and search maybe three moves or four moves ahead. And you assign your evaluation function to the horizon node, the board position. Then you back up and you update your your initial evaluation of the board position, and then you take the best move. So here you have an interplay between perception, which is the immediate evaluation, and reasoning, search ahead. And the question there is exactly the one that you mentioned, how far ahead would you go? But there is also a question of computational resources. You don't want to search ahead all the way to the checkmate because the the, uh, the number of board positions that you will need to search is exponential. It's super exponential, actually. So it's um, at a certain point, you got to tell yourself, I've searched long enough. It's time for me to make a move. Right. Yeah. I remember uh, in 85, when I was uh, studying computer science, I had taken a course, an AI course, actually, with uh you may perhaps you know him his uh his name was uh i, I don't want to say was maybe he's still alive i'm not sure uh professor monty newborn does that ring a bell no no monty newborn was apparently on the team the the big uh, the deep blue team the ibm team that was looking at uh modeling the decision trees when you play chess mm -hmm. and i remember in his course we had uh, we we had to as an assignment do you know study a game exactly along the lines of what you were talking about. You can't do an exhaustive, brutal search of all possibilities because I think in chess that's I don't know I think it's something like ten to the one hundred nodes or whatever the crazy number is. And therefore, in in we learned about alpha beta pruning. I don't know if that's still a thing where you then kind of cull you cut out these these parts of the trees that it's not worthwhile to go to. So even though I didn't know at the time then that this would come back many years later from my doctoral dissertation, that's the genesis of where I first learned about these kind of search algorithms. Yeah, that's exactly what uh, the kind of work I did in, where, in 1978 up to 1983 when I published the book Heuristic. And as a matter of fact, just to surprise you, I proved the optimality of alpha beta. Oh, look at that. Wow. <laughs> yes. it, you proved it analytically or through simulation? I, I, so through a model. I said, assuming that in the horizons, in the leaf node, let's call them leaf node, okay, yeah. you have a random assignment of values. Okay. Now, uh, is we can now cal calculate the average number of uh, search nodes that you'll have to go through. And I proved that alpha beta is giving you um, the best, uh, the best algorithm. There's no better algorithm that will examine less nodes than alpha beta. There's, there's no better algorithm of the ones that you were pitting against one another or, could, or conceptually there could never be a better algorithm than alpha beta. Conceptually, there could not be, wow, okay. a better, but on the average, in wow. particular instances, there could be. But on the average, assuming this uh, probabilistic model, when you spray random values on the node in the horizon, then I can cal calculate um, theoretically what is the optimal thing that anyone can do. The optimal uh, uh, number of nodes that need to be examined in the optimal case. 
and then I show that alpha beta reaches that optimum. Fantastic. Now, how does your work, when, when you're doing these sort of optimization works, how does that link up with actually another area that I used to be in before becoming a behavioral scientist? So in operations research, as you know, Judea, I mean, it's all about minimizing and maximizing some objective function, right? The traveling salesman problem, you've got eight cities, the, the traveling salesman has to go to all eight one time and come back. Which road should he or, he or she take in order to minimize cost, whatever? And I had actually worked as a research assistant when I was a student for several years on a problem called the two-dimensional cutting stock problem, which is a the following problem. If you have sheets of metal or sheets of wood or sheets mm -hmm. of glass and you, you receive an order from a client, I need 20 X by Y sheets and so on. How should mm. I do the guillotine cuts in order to minimize yeah. the waste? So how does optimization in the AI sense link yeah. up to optimization in OR? Okay, now this is a the sheet cutting problem is NP hard. Right. what I understand, yeah. I think uh, so, yeah. Uh, so do you want to explain? You want to just explain what NP hard because many of our students, uh, many of our viewers may not know what that means. Well, that was uh, one of the most, uh, I think, one of the most talked about problem in computer science. And many problems have the property that if one of them is polynomial, then all of them are polynomial. Okay? So um, they are equivalent in terms of complexity to each other. Like, for instance, traveling salesmen, okay? or to find a Hamiltonian circuit, or to or to find or to uh, find the cutting. Uh, uh, they have a name for that. Uh, Guillotine cuts. Guillotine cuts. Or like like uh, graph coloring. Yeah. Yes. yes, graph coloring. Yes. All these problems, if you uh, are, are hard in the sense that we don't know if there is a polynomial algorithm to solve them. Polynomial algorithm means that it grows polynomially in the number of nodes or the number of variables in the system. Yeah. But if you, so they have a name for that. And the problem that occupy, used to occupy all theoretical computer scientists to prove that uh, NP completeness is polynomial or whether it is polynomial, it's still an unsolved problem. Okay? However, now let's go back to the, sheet cutting problem or to the traveling salesman there the question was okay we cannot solve it in its um, optimal sense but we can absorb it approximately so what can we do to to get close to the optimal and here comes the idea of heuristic okay? an example for instance a traveling salesman has a heuristic, which is uh, the minimal spanning tree. Okay. If you if you change the graph to make it into a tree, right, and it's easy to find a minimal spanning tree, which means you retain from the original graph most of the important edges, okay, and then you can solve it exactly on a minimal on a spanning tree. So the exact solution for the spanning tree gives you a heuristic, an approximation for the true optimum. Right. Then you can do search and use the heuristic exactly like in the chess game. Exactly. You keep on deciding where to go further to, to get a better and better approximation. Now, I looked, one of my famous paper was how can a machine discover heuristics automatically? Okay. So, and this is a, a still being used today in planning, in planning things like uh, planning your trip to Europe. Okay. Uh, find not only the best path, but the minimal cost uh, uh, route, including the hassle in the airport right. and, the, and the smile of the stewardess. Okay, so we have uh, that kind of plan, complex planning problem. There are many, many paths, and you'll have to choose the right search uh, strategy in order to get to an optimal uh, plan. This, so the idea is that you plan with the heuristic, exactly like in the chess. 
but how do you discover heuristic? And here comes the key idea. What is heuristic? Heuristic to a hard problem is an exact solution to a simplified problem. Right. Which means you look at the problem, you say, I cannot solve the general graph. But if it was a tree, I would be able to solve it. So you approximate it. I'll give you a better idea. Okay. Uh, remember the game of um, 16 puzzle where you have um, four by four plastic uh, uh, square. Oh, the Ru Ru Rubik's Cube? It, let's say the Rubik's Cube. Okay. Okay, let's say the Rubik's Cube. And you have to go from one configuration to another one in a minimal number of moves. A heuristic will be, will be assuming that there are no constraints, that you can do it directly, any any place you want, no constraints. That's a simplified problem. If you have no constraints in a way, okay, you just go straight by a straight line. And you get to, so the straight line solution, the number of moves that you have to do, assuming straight line, no constraints, gives you a heuristic for the complex problem. And you can use it to find the optimal if it is really a simplified problem. That's that's incredible. Well, again, I'm 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 drawn my, my brain works through synthesis. I'm always trying to draw links between different things, perhaps like graph theory. And uh I'm thinking of you know the, the use of the term heuristics when I was a computer science student, and then the use of the term heuristics when I became a doctoral student in psychology of decision-making. And of course, the original gentleman who kind of was using those terms, not in computer science, although he made contributions to computer science, I you probably can guess where I'm going, was Herb Simon, who, oh, yeah. who won, of course, the Nobel Prize in, I think, 1978 in economics. And I have the distinct uh, honor that uh, my, my uh, former doctoral supervisor knew Herb Simon well, and he had come to visit Cornell, I think in 1993, Herb Simon did. And uh, I still have a memo that was written by my doctoral supervisor where it says, you know, comments about uh, this your sequential work by Herb Simon. And I've kept it, I should frame it. Uh, and this is when I was first uh, exposed to the idea, I mean, during my doctoral training to bounded rationality that because yeah. of computational costs, because of cognitive costs. So how much of your work that you specifically, I mean, of course, AI is is in part, you know, cognitive psychology, but how much of your work utilizes human subjects in experiments and so on? Or have you never crossed that divide in your own work? Very lightly, tenuously. No, no. I just, I just read the writings of psychologists like uh, Trelsky and Kahneman, like uh, Herbert Simon, and he did a lot of work on uh, human problem solvers. Uh, I, just reading, I perhaps it has more than I think right now, but uh, I have not experimented with human subjects. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So uh, that... is it because? So is it more likely that your work would be utilized? by the experimental psychologist more than the other way around. They Correct, will... yes. Okay, yes, got it. Absolutely, yes. They will use this kind of models to explain their finding or to fit their findings into the model so they can ask the next question. Yes, got you. Now, now when I you can were... give you an example. Go, go. For instance, uh, Alison Gopnik, who is doing work on how children learn cause-effect relationship in the crib. Okay? So she's using the graph models nice. to model the behavior of a baby. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, sus I, I suppose that the way that we know that a lot of your work is being exported in other areas is to refer back to what I mentioned at the, in the intro, which is the, the number of citations that you have, because you're developing a set of methodologies that can be used by all sorts of people across many disciplines where we're studying thinking and hence your huge impact in so many areas by definition, correct? Wow, I should not miss mentioning Rummelhart, okay, who is a cognitive psychologist whose laboratory I visited in 1976 in the uh, University of California, San Diego. 
Oh, I, Rumel Hart was in San Diego. I thought he was at Stanford. I must be. Could it be Stanford? Perhaps he moved. Okay. But I met him in San Diego, and he was working on the problem of how children can read text so quickly, so reliably, so fast, you know, and uh, with a minimum amount of uh, cognitive ability. Yes. And he came out with a model which I have adapted for the Bayesian network. Ah, very nice. Well, yes. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Rumelhart might be the the former doctoral supervisor. I could be misspeaking here, so forgive me if, if uh, to my viewers if I make an error. But I, but two of my good friends who are both cognitive and evolutionary psychologists, Peter Todd and Jeffrey Miller, I think both of them might have come out of the PhD lab of Rumor Hart. Somebody will probably correct me, but I certainly know the name quite well. I'm, I'm trying to think now of other names that uh, I remember from my days of computer science, and I would love to, to get your, uh, you know, insights on any of them. I remember John von Neumann, uh, of course, the Hungarian, uh, you're smiling. Why are you smiling, Professor? Because I, 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 I haven't met him. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but of course, we oh, can see that he was unbelievable. One of, the, one of the giants that you don't expect to meet. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That, that would have been one guy that I would have loved to have on this show. John von Neumann, if you guys don't know him, you should check him out. Unbelievable. All sorts of influence, including in game theory. The other few that I would like to mention, uh, I remember Knuth when mm -hmm. uh, studying, you know, databases and, sir, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Is he is he still alive? Is he still around? He is. He is alive. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Now, the one, that I, circle, yes. the one that I'm most interested in speaking with you that ha is the namesake of the award that you won, the Turing Award, is, is of course, Alan Turing. Now, he, of course, he, he, died, he died many, many years ago, tragically. But of all the courses I've taken, Judea, in all of my career, which is a lot of courses in my long academic career, the course that blew my mind the most for almost being mystical in its profundity and depth was a course that I took. It was, I think, a graduate course, but I took it as an undergraduate. Uh, it was formal languages where we learned all this, the, the Turing stuff. And, and I still have that textbook. Uh, I can't remember. It's the classic one from the 80s. You, you maybe even remember the, the site. I can't remember the, the name of the book. But uh, I opened the book recently. I was you know, going to my office and my children were there. And I saw all my little notes in, inside the book, obviously, as I was preparing for the exams and so on. And when you open that book, it's a completely different language. It's a language that has now become impenetrable to me because I forgot some of the stuff. But it is all I remember is that it was almost like I've never taken drugs, but it's almost as though what one should feel when they go on a intellectual high, because I could not believe that someone could come up with this kind of stuff. The, the level of intelligence that this guy must have had is off the charts. Any, any thoughts on what I just said? Uh, I, I agree with you because it's dealing with the most rudimentary, elementary part of our brain, the idea of computation. What is computation? Okay. What is the limit of computation? And so that is why it's a, um, en enchanting to so anyone who reads it and keeps on uh, thinking that this is really us. Okay? What we're reading about computer or moving tape, it's really us, our brain. He's talking about the limitation of our intelligence or our, our ability to comprehend things and to compute things. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, always intriguing and um, interesting. Do you but, feel uh, I, I, I'm more familiar with his work in on uh, on the Turing test, you know, in the 1950 articles on Can Machine Think? Yeah. which appeared in Mind magazine in uh, 1950, where he asked the question about can machine think, and he proposes the um, uh, emulation game exactly. or the imitation game. No, there's a movie named Imitation of Game, Of course, right? yes. 
Well, sure. I was very happy when that movie came out because my from from my perspective, I think that too few people know of Alan Turing and popular culture, right? I mean, it's totally <laughs> natural for people to say, what do you think? You're some sort of Einstein. Uh, Einstein is now the term that you use for someone who is very intelligent. It's a it's an adjective, right? And of yeah. course, we, you know, the, the common person walking down the street could probably list a few very famous uh, thinkers throughout history, Einstein and Newton and Darwin. And of course, they, they, they deserve their position there. Turing, very few people outside of a you know restrained area, right? Every computer scientist is going to know Turing. Maybe some cognitive psychologists are going to know Turing, but the guy walking on the street, in my view, should know Turing, but he doesn't. So for if only for that, I was delighted to see that movie. That's uh, really interesting. Why is Einstein a symbol of intelligence and not Turing? Exa exactly. Is it, is it because <laughs> because People think in Newtonian mechanics, and they were uh, shattered when general relativity came about. Oh, and, and I think there is something. And romantic. there wasn't such a there wasn't such a, a revolution about computation. We didn't have a Newtonian mechanics in computer science that uh, uh, was revolutionized by Turing. So and, he was and, first. and yeah. I would think, if I can add to what you said, I think. To answer your question, why Einstein not Turing? Because there is something inherently romantic to the layperson about what Einstein is talking about, right? Even though for most people it's impenetrable the details, but you know the universe, the cosmos, time and space. Boy, that sounds romantic. That sounds esoteric. That sounds so deep it's beyond my grasp. Whereas the reality is, I mean, the technical stuff of Turing is unbelievably, uh, you know, profound. But it doesn't, it's not like poetry. Most people can't link up to that stuff. So could that be it? We don't see our own computation. We see rays of light. And we see the stars moving around. But we don't see our own computer. Exactly. So <laughs> true. inside. Uh, going back to what you mentioned earlier when you said, uh, you know, if you're going on a trip, you can use an optimization problem. This speaks to something that I constantly try to impart uh, to my students, and I, I don't know how successful I've been. So, for example, when, I, when I'm when i lecturing to MBA students, I, I teach at a business school. Uh, I'm housed in a business school. And so I often tell them that I implore them, please take quantitative courses because nature in general and, of course, business problems often involve you know, analysis of data, of course, but they involve optimization problems, minimization, maximization. And so the types of skills that you need to, uh, you know, obtain while you are a student in, an, in a business school should be that hard stuff that won't be, you know, uh, approachable to you within five minutes on the job, right? It's, it's kind of hard to pick up on the fly how to use the algorithm to solve the traveling salesman problem but to take a course on how to motivate your employees and i'm not denigrating that that's something that you probably either have the instinct to do well or not you don't need to take mm. a course so you should be spending your valuable time when you're at a business school taking those technical courses that otherwise you'll never be exposed to uh I mean, you're in a you're housed somewhere else, so you don't have to be you don't have to be giving that pitch to students. But do, do you have any insights as to how we can convince students that are otherwise not mathematically oriented to actually see the beauty of the type of stuff that you do? I I happened to uh, to go to the Technion and start engineering, so I was in the quantitative world from day one. So I haven't um, seen the need to convince anyone <laughs> to go <laughs> and take qualitative. <laughs> but you may be right. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about my grandchildren, if I need to convince them. Uh, but I, I simply have a different motivation. You have to be able to um, articulate your research problem. This is the hardest thing, and it is the most important thing. What is, why are you doing any thinking or research or um, employed? Why are you wasting your time here? 
what is your research question? And this question requires to have a model of the universe. Because you want to ask questions about the universe, right? So you have to articulate it. And this is already 50% um, of your job. Once you articulate it and you have a language to uh, express it and you have a logic to infer new things from what you know, this is the way ahead. You can't miss. You can't right. lose. That, that, that's, uh, you're, and you're... that is what quantitative uh, um, science gives you in any field, whether it is in psychology or in, in business or in marketing. Exactly. Beautiful. Well, I was going to say that one of the things that I find very difficult is to convince the students that even though they may not be mathematicians, there is a they can still learn some of these approaches at a level that will make it relevant for them. So, for example, many multivariate statistical approaches, uh, cluster analysis and factor analysis and uh, uh, discriminant analysis and conjoint analysis all of these techniques can be studied at the level of a statistician, uh, or they could be studied by other people who are going to be practitioners of those methods, but they still have to have some rudimentary knowledge about the background algorithms that are, that are generating these methodologies. And that then allows you to answer certain questions that would have been completely invisible to you if you didn't have those tools, correct? I totally agree with you. It, both, it works both ways. You have to know the um, capability of your quantitative tools. I'll give you an example. You have to know if you have two equations and two unknown, then you can solve it. But you have two equations with three unknown, give up. Like, don't try. Okay, You're going to save many man hours. Okay? And, and, and this is something that you learned that in straight algebra. Right. So this is a case where you are a user and you have a bunch of tools. You have to appreciate the capability of your tools. And these work the other way around. If you are a, uh, a quantitative a statistician and you want to do something about the real world, you have to do something which is contrary to your upbringing, which yeah. is to incorporate a model of the world against your textbook. Yes. Because the textbook says we should deal with data and data and data. No opinion and no models. Because every model of the world is outside the province of statistics. So this works both ways. Yes. For statisticians to incorporate a model and for a modeler to know what the statistical techniques can do for you. Well, you know, I when I when I went to pursue my PhD, the idea was to be a quantitative jock because I came from a mathematics background and so on. And, and so I was going to be, you know, a, a mathematical modeler of, you know, economic choice, consumer choice and so on. But then when I got to uh, Cornell, uh, I met up with my former doctoral supervisor who was trained as a uh, psychologist, uh, along with Tversky and Kahneman, he he came out of that exact same. I mean, they the first paper of my supervisor was with Amos Tversky. They were mm -hmm. all uh, PhD students at. Uh, what was at, his name? J. Russo, R. U. S. S. O. Uh, another one that you might know who was also part of that gang, who was also one of my professors at Cornell, is Richard Thaler, who went, won the Nobel Prize in 2017 in economics. So I came out of that whole gang of you know uh, psychology and decision making. But the original goal wasn't that. I was going to be a hardcore quantitative guy, right? Uh, and I'm so happy that I ended up, you know, you were talking earlier about the, the jump from one to the other. I'm living proof that you can kind of go from one to the other. And, I, and many of the most famous psychologists, you know, much more accomplished than I am, a la Tversky and Kahneman, all came from mathematics backgrounds. Which leads me to the next point, if I can offer advice to the, some of the viewers who are listening here. One of the things that I learned in computer science and mathematics was how to think, right? It didn't matter to me whether I would eventually apply dempster schafer theory or Hamiltonian or, you know, uh, uh, differential equations. 
but I learned a method of deep thinking that I could have not otherwise had access to. Alan Turing with his formal languages, right? So I think that when people are looking for education, if you don't, you know, if you want to be an accountant, then fine, study accounting. But if all you want is to have rigorous training on how to think, the default one has to be mathematics and to some extent computer science. Am I right? But I'm surprised you, you, yeah, you're right. I, I remember at the first in Kahneman was first statisticians, uh, at least in, in mind, before they became psychologists. Exactly. Okay? And as essentially, <clears throat> What triggered most of the works was the discrepancy between what the mathematics tells you and how people behave. Okay. The, the violation of the transitivity axiom, right? If I prefer car A to car B and I prefer car B to car C, I must prefer car A to car C. That's an axiom of rational choice. And of course, Tversky, 1969, I think, showed that that's not how humans behave. And so their whole work stems from that tension. Yeah, and the idea of to, to take a discrepancy, which they call the, par, not paradoxes, they call illusion, illusion, yes. yeah, to take them and to look at them as a window through which we can see the workings of the mind. Yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. Like well, optical illusion. Yeah, exactly. Very much like optical illusion. Yeah. Exactly right. Uh, but in this case, it's a cognitive illusion. Uh, uh, before we get to the the book of why, I just wanted to mention, because you were saying, you know, why is it that you're doing this research? What's the research question you're asking? Who cares about this? Uh, this reminds me of a paper that I always assign to my graduate students, uh, my, my PhD students, not uh, not MBA students. Uh either MS or PhD students. It's it's a 1971 paper, Judea. I wonder if you know it. It's It was written by a sociologist. And the paper, it's a, it's Davis 1971. It's called, That's Interesting! Exclamation point. Basically, what he offered was a set of 12 criteria by which you can judge whether your research question is an interesting one. And, and you're going to see in a second how I'm going to link it to your work on causality, because most of the most, if not all of the 12 criteria were a variation of the following theme. I thought that A and B were related, and I found out that they're not. I thought that A caused B, but it turns out that B causes A. So in his framework, most of the, what makes something interesting mm -hmm. is that it's counterintuitive or surprising. And of course, that's not the only metrics of interestingness. Yeah. But so I, I was wondering, are you familiar with that paper? No, I'm not. I'm not. But it's very interesting. You know, for us in AI, we have a different set of, uh, I would say, um, bullets for what makes a problem interesting. Here is the behavior of human people. Can we emulate it on a machine? Can you do it? Has anybody else did it? If not, it's a research problem. It's a giant research problem. Here is something which people can perform. Here are questions that people can answer. Can a machine answer? If not, what kind of data is needed? What kind of assumptions? And suppose I give you the assumption. Can your algorithm do it? And so we have an infinite flux, infinite stream of new new problem uh, problems, which are interesting by definition. Because if you can do it and machine cannot, it's a huge problem. I, I remember. Connecting. I remember when I was, uh, you know, looking for possible avenues for my, you know, doctoral work. Uh, I, I mentioned this earlier in our chat, I thought about, you know, using artificial neural networks. So I got into the literature on connectionism and I had gone to see a computer scientist at Cornell, not, not, the, not Alberto Segre, who ended up being on my committee, another one. And I was telling her, is there a way to use, you know, artificial neural networks to really, you know, model the type of consumer decision-making and human decision-making that I, I, I'm interested in studying. And she looked at me and laughed and scoffed. And she said, 
if you were able to do that kind of modeling by the end of your career, it would be an ambitious project. We, we can't even have connectionist networks that recognize which letter is which. So this is like <laughs> in the early 90s and you want to model, you know, the human cognition. Mm -hmm. uh, so where are we right now on this trajectory? 1980s, when I first was exposed to AI, yeah. AI was going to solve the world. Has AI met its potential <laughs> or are you disappointed by where we are in AI? It's very interesting that you put two together. You said something. We have a problem uh, that uh, people in marketing or in business are seem to be quite proficient with, right? And here we have a neural network that's supposed to model the mind, right? So if they are modeling the mind, why shouldn't they do what we do, right? It's a very simple, uh, uh, very natural question to ask. Well, it turns out I know why. Go ahead. I know why. <laughs> okay, they don't have a model of the world. Okay. And that's where your work comes in. That's right. And they will never do that with the kind of um, handcuffs that are putting on themselves today. Uh, we know the limitations now. We know what you need to do certain class of problems that is in the ladder of causation or the ladder of knowledge is a better word. And, and if you don't have data of a, or input of a certain kind, you cannot solve the problem in a certain class. It's, just, it's a Chomsky hierarchy, or if you want a, a Turing impossibility, although I don't want to pretend that I'm as great as Turing, but we have found a limitation, basic limitation, in what uh, machine learning can do. Machine learning uh, systems can do that guides us into doing things correctly. Right. So, I mean, and what you, because you use the word lather, and I think in, in your most recent book, The Book of Why, you talk about sort of the three ladders of causations, and then you go into each of these. Is it maybe worthwhile yeah. for you to give us a quick summary of these three ladders? Oh, no, it's very easy for me to explain to uh, even laymen what the ladder stands for. On the uh, lowest level, you have uh, seeing. S-E-E-I-N-G, seeing, or <clears throat> predicting what will happen in one variable if you see another. Okay? I've seen uh, a customer buying uh, uh, toothpicks, and I can assume that this customer would also be interested in dental floss or in, uh, in a, a toothpaste. So this is a, a just prediction. I have seen something, and I infer the likelihood of something else happening. This is the level of statistics. This is the level of neural net going on today. I see a bunch of much it's diff, different size. I've seen a million pixels, and I can tell you it's a pussycat or it's a tiger. Okay. So it's a different scale altogether, but it's still a matter of classification. So it's still operating at level one of the ladder. Level one of the of the ladder, inferring something from what you see. The next level is inferring something from what you do. Action, active agent, changing things in the world. For instance, if I wake up in the if I'm a uh, president of a company and I become greedy one day, I want to say, uh, what will happen if I double the price? Well, I double the price of a toothpick, of a toothpaste. Okay? <laughs> With the customer that bought um, a toothpaste yesterday, he would also buy it with a new price. Okay? But the, the price was never doubled before. So even if I look at the record of the company, or it may have been doubled before, but for different reason, I had a different share of the market. Okay? So uh, you're trying to infer a change in the world from by uh, it is created by doing, and you have to know what change and what remains intact. 
So is this what would be called, uh, let's say, in regression analysis, sensitivity analysis, or Absolutely what? Absolutely no. It's not that. No. What? Why? Why? Because once you mention regression analysis, I know that regression is a probabilistic notion. Okay. Prob probability cannot capture doing actions. It's just seeing. So all the stuff about probability from Shannon information theory, entropy, you name it, okay? Um, Bayes theorem, um, everything which was developed up to 1950, I would say, is probabilistically based. Probability language cannot capture the idea of action and change. So that, Why? Sorry, so just, yeah. just so on, forgive me for interrupting you. So are you saying then that when you're talking about your ladders, it's it's a deterministic world? If it's not probabilistic, it's deterministic? No, it's probabilistic. Oh, okay. It's still probabilistic, but probability alone cannot capture it. Got it. You need something else. Okay. You need a model. So a model can tell you how the probability changes with the action. Got it. The, I can. I would like to tell you some uh, the relationship because some of your audience probably understand Bayes theorem. Sure. Right. What does Bayes theorem gives us in uh, in probability theory? If you have a probability theory, then the probability theory itself, the the probability model itself, tells you how your belief is going to change if you see something by base theorem, right? So you don't need to have any extra information except the probability function itself to tell you how the probability will change if you see something. It's all in base theorem. It's a beautiful and very powerful thing that we all gotten used to. However, the probability um, function in itself cannot tell you how it ought to change if you do something to change it. For instance, make me laugh. I, I give you an action. Okay. Or double the price. Okay. All these are actions which changes the probability function by external force. Yeah. Not by looking and getting more information, but by external force. I double the price. I made you laugh. Okay, I, that is a different kind of ball game altogether. You need to have an extra information. Extra, I mean, in addition to the probability function. So then if we go back to what you mentioned earlier about how we use models to simplify the world in heuristics, Bayes' model becomes a, simplify, a, a simplification of that additional stuff that you're adding, the laughter, the doubling the price. Is, is adding more, or, or is it reducing the no. degree of freedom? How can I, we wouldn't, I wouldn't make the analogy. No, the analogy doesn't catch here. No. Got it. This is all, not your, no heuristic here. It's correct. Okay. You have a set of belief. You believe in things in the world, okay? Now you go and you, you ask somebody for information. You find out that this somebody has cancer, okay? Your belief about the world changes. Right, because you find a new fact: the guy has cancer. You can you can think about the ramification of that fact. The family is going to suffer. There's a cost of funeral. Who knows? Okay, he's going to go to the hospital. All these are beliefs that came about because you find this new fact. Okay, how do you how do you compute it? From base theorem, you had a, a complete set of belief about the world. This set of belief already tells you how it's going to change if you find the fact. Right. It's a beautiful and very powerful, I call it a beloved oracle. <laughs> so that's level two. And what's that's, not, the... that's level one. That's level one. Oh, we're still at level one. Okay. Because we're still talking about belief and seeing something new. You saw a new fact. Now it's complete. Forget it now. Because it ain't going to work in the case of actions actually i double the price which means i change the whole belief function by external force i need to have a calculus for change 
And is that that's where your belief networks and so on come in? It's at level that's two. Where the the DAG comes in. Okay. The DAG is a model of who listens to whom, which variable listen to who. Once you have it, which is not in the probability, it's not in the probability language. It has a a new connective called listens. Okay. They, your cholesterol level listens to your diet and listen to the amount of exercise. It, just, it depends on it causally. It's a new entity. Once you have it, and you know who listens to whom, you can now solve all action problems. Right. Done. That is not enough. We still have a third level, right. which is imagining, which is counterfactual. Okay. And that requires not only to know who listens to whom, but also to know the function that connects one variable to another. Yeah. Got it. Beautiful. The function behind the edge in the graph, behind the arrow. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, but, okay, go ahead. No. Yeah, I was going to say, it, so here's one way that I can see, because remember earlier I asked you, is there a way to link up some of your work to experimental you know, science with actual human subjects? So has there been research, I, and I suspect there has been, where you, for example, look at people's abilities to either perform well or poorly on causal inferencing tasks as a function, for example, of personality traits? And the, the, let, me, let, me, let me set the context of why I'm saying this. One of the things we know that's the hardest to do in, in, in the universe is to alter someone's positions. Once you mm -hmm. anchor me in a position, it's going to take a Herculean effort, especially if those positions are political, especially if those positions are religious. So suddenly, we're no longer these you know, unbiased information processing machines. It doesn't matter how much information you show me. I'm going to go la, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. So is there research that takes a lot of this you know, a lot of these tasks that are inherent to whichever levels you're talking about and linking in, linking them to actual personality traits of people to see whether that can predict how well we do on these tasks. There is. In AI, there is a, a subfield called uh, persuasion. Right. Or the, the calculus of argumentation. Yes. Yes. It developed, but I am going to uh, tackle it in my own research in the future, because I believe now with what we understand about the ladder of causation, we have the ability to model your listener state of mind and state of belief, and that way to understand what kind of utterances, what kind of arguments would sway the opinion and the belief system of the listener. Okay. But this is something which is blue sky for me now. I just have this strong feeling in my finger, look at my finger, that we can do it. Well, so let me, let me. this is a wonderful place to link. Uh, earlier today, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, Judea. I very, uh, you know, just a few hours before we were going to chat, I sent you a couple of papers, one of which was a paper where I discussed this approach uh, nomological networks of cumulative evidence. The idea being that if you have a particular phenomenon that you wish to demonstrate that it's veridicality, you know, uh, uh, sex, uh, sex specific toy preferences are not socially constructed. They are biological based. Okay. So, so at the center of the nomological network is that statement. Now, what would be the information that I would need to collect to prove to you that the sex specificity of toy preferences are indeed biological based. And so what I argue in that paper and also in chapter seven of the parasitic mind is that I can collect data for you from across mm -hmm. time, from across methods, from across uh, cultures, from across species in many cases, across methodologies. So imagine a orgiastic, epistemological triangulation that then from all different distinct lines of evidence, we're coming to the same final conclusion. I wonder if there is a way to link this approach, which by the way, 
the guy who is most famous for doing it, although he didn't use the language I'm using now, is Charles Darwin. Because what did Charles Darwin do to demonstrate the, the strength of his theory of evolution? He spent 20, 30 years collecting data from completely different sources, right? From geology, from comparative anatomy, from uh, uh, ecology, from biodiversity, all of which pointed to his theory being correct. So is there a way to link what I just said within the frameworks that you work in? Well, the, the two issues here. By, one is the differences in personality. Uh, some people stick to their previous beliefs uh, stronger than others. Some We call them open-minded. We call them religious okay, adherents. Uh, so I, I haven't I haven't thought about how what makes a difference. I only know that uh, you can see it also in babies. It, some babies are restless until they understand things on their own, and some will just let go if if it if it doesn't buy them any uh, material advantage. They were just not curious. But I don't know how to model it. This difference in personality, I don't know. It it should be done. But I also, that's one connection that I see. And the other one, that this is trade-off between um, um, environmental factors and the in hereditary factors is also the problem, the puzzle that uh, caused uh, Sewell Wright to establish his path diagram. Namely, he was the first to decide that statistics needs augmentation and the cause-effect relationship needs to have a mathematics of their own. So, so you see the, this problem, it, it was a problem that no one could solve ahead of him. And he was a mathematician. Okay? So he tried to put on paper this puzzle. Forget about the solution, right. just the puzzle, okay? If I want to find experimental evidence for hereditary transmission versus environmental factors, how would I, how express it? Can this is what became a... eventually behavioral genetics, correct? Where you're trying to tease out the shared environment, the unshared environment and the genetics, and you create an equation that tries to calculate the percentage that each contribute. That's exactly correct. I think yes. what you're talking about. Yes. But he worked with guinea pigs, not with humans. Okay. Right? Uh, there was a, yeah, somebody, the social scientist found his work and applied it to uh, human education. Right. Yeah, a lot of, it's in the book of why, the experiments uh, about twins. Some, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because behavioral genetics typically use the twin twins registry uh, methodology. Uh, yeah. I, I've done one paper looking at the genetics of, of decision-making where we uh, connected with a group in out of England, I think it was the St. Thomas Hospital, they have this huge twins registry. We wanted to show that monozygotic twins were more likely to have similar patterns of decision-making than dizygotic twins, fraternal twins. And that's exactly what we found in that paper. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, I, I love that stuff. Okay, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to move now. Uh, I hope we haven't bored our viewers too much with our technical talk. Uh, of course, I think it's fascinating. I'd like to spend maybe the next few minutes uh, discussing some uh, personal matters, if that's okay with you, Judea. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to start, we'll end it a bit more positive, but I'd like to start, I, I, I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, the incredibly tragic story, for those of you who don't know, uh, Judea Pearl's uh, son, uh, Daniel, in 2002, I think, was kidnapped and tortured by some... Uh, uh, extremists in Pakistan and then he was killed and he uh, famously uh, said at the end, uh, you know, my father's Jewish, my mother's Jewish, I'm Jewish and then they killed him and it's something that I can very much relate to because I escaped Lebanon under very similar conditions uh, when I grew up in the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, by the way, we have someone in common uh, that we know Asra Nomani oh, is, yeah. is a person who's been on my show. She's a good friend of mine. Of course, she was linked to Daniel's uh, wife, if I remember correctly. So I guess my question to you, uh, Judea, is in the in the little since I've known you, uh, 
you know, a month or so. We, we've spoken on the phone. We've gotten to know each other a, a bit. You seem like a terribly jovial, very humble, fun guy. Uh, unlike what you might think of, you know, very elite professors who are always, you know, dour and serious. And so you've been able to maintain a joy of life that's quite remarkable, notwithstanding the worst possible thing that a parent can face. Are there any secrets that might explain how you were able to survive and go on with your life, given what you were, what you faced with Daniel's tragedy? I, I don't know. I, I cannot answer it because I, I've never been a pessimistic person in my life. So I, I cannot relate and ask myself, what made the difference? I'm, well, it's I'm just, just your disposition. It's just your you were, you're inoculated against it by virtue of you having a positive, happy disposition that protected you against the worst possible disaster. Could be, well, yeah. I remember myself being joyful all my life. No, it's not true. Not true. <laughs> but it's the first time I have to ask this question because <laughs> no, I I I wasn't. Very happy in high school, but uh, is no, it, I, mean, is it... I think that the, the 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 scientific part plays a role here. Me growing in Israel, it also plays a role. So I grew up with a silver teaspoon in my mouth. I I was supposed to be the new Jew who doesn't know anything about anti-Semitism, who is uh, strong and uh, reflect all the positive things that the Jews always wanted to be, to be normal, number one. Okay? <laughs> so I was fed all the goodies that my parents and my environment and the, the state in the way could offer. Okay? So I grew in an incubator of uh, care that could have been the reasons why I feel uh, good about myself and I also um, enjoyed science in the Technion and I've been um, taught luckily all my generation taught by giants professors they were not a regular college professor they were top professors in Heidelberg in Berlin that came over in the 1930s and taught high school and taught in the colleges, but they were giants in their field and they knew that they will never go and be able to do their own research. So they took care of us as an embodiment of their lost dreams. So we got very good exposure to uh, research and we loved science. And that also gave me a boost that I can, I can, I can play, play games in the science. Case, uh, oh, I love that you say this. Stop, forgive me for interrupting you. My forthcoming book, which is about how to be happy and to live the good life. I have a chapter which I title Life as a Playground. And in that oh. chapter, I argue that science, which you think is this austere, serious uh, endeavor, is nothing but a form of adult play. So I'm, absolutely. Oh, yes, I love beautiful. that you said that. Yeah, it, it, I, I use the analogy, the playground, quite often. Yes, it's a playground. Um, uh, uh, the whole AI is a laboratory in the severe sense, but it's a playground to, to understand it in our own computation. Right about emulating ourselves. So it's a laboratory for emulating ourselves. But now go to science, we are, I'm talking about the joy of doing something today that you couldn't do yesterday. Right. That is a, a tremendous goy, a joy. Now, in my field now, doing something today that not only I could not do today, that the great giants from Aristotle until Fisher could not do for a thousand years. Okay? That's even a greater sight. That's what is called revolution. Right. <laughs> okay. And that's why I, I, I have a second title to the book of why 
saying the new science of cause and effect. And some people um, criticize me. How can you be so boasting and call it a new science? Or somebody yes, yesterday said, whenever I see somebody writing new science, I become skeptical. It <laughs> might be some, <laughs> some um, self-conceited well, uh, you're, you're, you're hardly self-conceited or boastful because someone... I'm telling you, yeah, I'm telling you. I have this, perhaps it's an illusion, but it, it, at least I can demonstrate it. We can do something today that wasn't done and that giants in before us could not do and wanted to do. Yeah. And that's what makes me feel, hey, it's a great playground. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I think one of the reasons why I, I remember when you and I first communicated and then we had a phone chat, I got off the phone. And uh, so my, my wife said, so are we, do you think we're going to meet Judea while we're here? We spent several weeks in Newport Beach, which is about an hour away from where you were, an hour and a half. And I said, you know, I was, I was uh, so thrilled to have spoken to you because we connected on a play level in the, in the sense that we were able to be jocular with each other as if we knew one another for you know 30 years whereas we had just met and i said to i said to her you know what i think we're going to have a riot together when we when we have our chat because i think it very much comes from this playful attitude this playful mentality and oftentimes if i can speak of myself people misconstrue my playfulness, I mean, I know you follow me on, on Twitter and that's how I first, uh, you know, followed you back and so on. Uh, I, you know, I can be the very serious professor who talks about formal languages and Alan Turing. And I can also post a clip as I did yesterday of my daughter, putting my young daughter putting makeup on me. One doesn't exclude the other, right? <laughs> I can be a serious thinker if, if I'm that but also be a playful, joking, regular guy. And I think that's what's beautiful about some of the, the greatest minds that I've had a chance to meet. They actually are very down to earth. They're very humble. They're very sweet. Oftentimes when I am playful, it's taken as a measure of unseriousness. Professor Saad, don't joke like this. It, it, is, it demeans you. It hardly demeans me. It makes me a multifaceted human being. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Especially when the, especially when the joke is serious. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I, mean, right. I sometimes tweet with jokes. I, I I tweet jokes on the Twitter. Yeah, but I it sometimes it's really deep. It's not just a joke. Exactly, it, <laughs> and it it goes by as a joke. In which case, I'm I'm I'll give you just yesterday. I said, could a neural net ever reject a drug that is good for men, good for women, and bad for a person? <laughs> okay. It's a joke, okay? Yeah. But it's so deep, I'm telling you, because neural nets cannot reject it. But I know why they cannot reject it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the people who vow by neural net didn't capture it. Yeah. But it's so in Twitter. I think it's a poetry of science because you have to condense an idea into 280 characters, right? Well, by the way, that that's why I, I mean, as as I think you know by now, because you know you you follow some of my stuff. The reason why I use satire, sarcasm, and mockery because mm -hmm. it is an incredibly powerful persuasion technique, right? It, it's uh -huh. not a, yeah. it's not a measure of being unserious. To the contrary, right? A a a, a well honed satirist is very very triggering to a dictator precisely because dictators are a lot more afraid with guys with sharp tongues rather than guys with big muscles that's why you put to death the satirist and also i think because uh, uh, humor implies sincerity and uh, openness and if you can joke about yourself and you're honest. I have nothing to hide. I'm right. not trying to put on the face of a big professor or one who knows everything. I'm fallible. And let's enjoy and, under, 
that enjoy our fallibility and strive to understand it better. What a beautiful thing. Last question for you, Judea. You ready? Uh, it's a question that I often ask my guests, if if only because in, in one of the last chapters of my current forthcoming book, I talk about regret. And, you know, part of living a good life is hopefully if if at the end of your life, not that you're at the end of your life, I don't mean to apply that, may you live to be well over 100. But, uh, you know, if you look back at your life and you say, you know what, I have very few regrets, then probably you've made good choices and so on. Now, before I ask you what your regrets might be in life, let me mm -hmm. set it up. Uh, giving you a chance to think about it. Uh, one of my former professors at Cornell, uh, a psychologist by the name of Tom Gilovich, he was a, or is a pioneer in the study of the psychology of regret. And he talks about two types of regret, regret due to action. I regret that I cheated on my wife and now we are divorced uh, versus regret due to inaction. I regret that I never went to medical school and instead became an engineer because my dad has an engineering firm. And it turns mm -hmm. out that over the long run, most people regret inactions more than actions. So if I pose this question to you, an incredibly accomplished academic into the ninth decade of his life, if you have any past regrets, would you be willing to share any of these with us? <laughs> yeah, that's tough because I'm very close, you know, to, uh, <laughs> to the judgment day. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. In Arabic, we have an expression, which I'm going to say it in Arabic. And Arabic is my mother tongue, if you don't know Judea. But in Arabic, you say, like, may you reach 100. So don't say that. The judgment day is very far away from you. Go. Oh, no, I have a better saying than that. Go. Go. <laughs> I'm 85, which means I have guaranteed 35 more years of productive work. <laughs> Till 120. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what we are wishing each other. Till 120. Right? Very true. Very true. <laughs> Amen. Uh, okay. So do you have any regrets that you'd like to share? Uh, regrets of things which I have done. I, I'm sure I've... Done or not people. done. It could be action yeah. or inaction. I once I had a regret that I didn't go into psychology or I didn't go into... Uh, the humanity uh, in high school, for instance, I oscillated between the real, real uh, quantitative method and humanity, and I oscillated. I shifted from one to another. I couldn't decide, and I always regretted why I was in the in the other domain. But anyhow, I don't. Uh, it doesn't answer your question. Well, no, hold on. I'm gonna solve that regret for you. H how about right now on this show? We commit to working on some eventual paper together, which will turn you into a psychologist by proxy. And I can walk around saying, I published a paper with the great Judea Pearl. Everybody wins. <laughs> deal? Okay. It's a deal. That's all right. Phenomenal. Hey, Judea, uh, so unbelievable. What an honor to meet you and talk to you. Uh, I hope that the next time that I'll be in California, we'll have a chance to meet in person. Are there any last... Uh, things that you might want to say in terms of promotion of course people go get the book of why it is fantastic is there anything else that you'd like to promote before we wrap it up uh, yes uh, join the discussion some people call it a fight on uh, twitter we are <laughs> people should be engaged engaged yes and ask questions Ex exactly right Thank you so much. Stay on the line so we could say officially goodbye offline. Thank you so much, Judea. A real pleasure to meet you. Thank you, God.